you know, you can't let something like COVID just affect you. You have to be able to find a way to work around it. Your, you know, your story is there, your, your, your mentality, your positive mentality is there. How can I still drive the brand that I've been creating over the years and to still get, you know, make profit so I can pay for my bills, I can pay for the kids' foods and everything. How can I do that? So once you really ask yourself all these questions, it makes you think, huh, I need to think outside the box. I need to think like a pizza place. You know, what would they do differently? Welcome to the Direct Farm Podcast, the weekly listen for farm selling direct. We'll talk about the four levers for farm success, which are quality, brand, price, and convenience. We'll hear from outside industry experts and producers like you to delight your customers, to save time, and to increase your direct farm sales and business. We're glad you're here. Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to the Direct Farm Podcast. And if you're joining us because you heard about this at the conference on Tuesday, then welcome. We're really excited you're here and continuing to learn about your brand. If you do not know what I'm talking about, we had the Direct Farm Series brand conference on Tuesday. It was a free virtual event, and you can go watch all of the sessions freely and virtually at directfarmconference.com. We had some really incredible keynote speakers join us. Curtis Koff is from REI. He's their chief digital officer, talked to us about mission-driven brand loyalty, and Emily Moose, who is the communications and outreach director for A Greener World, which is an independent certifier, they came and talked about how you really build that consumer trust that they've done such a good job of cultivating. We also heard from some very familiar names, if you are a regular listener of this podcast. We heard from Joe Shermer at Dirty Girl Produce, from Angelica Hayton at Hayton Farms Berries, and from Daphne Biquez, who we're going to be hearing from again today on this episode. Daphne, both at the brand conference and in this episode, talked to us about what storytelling means when you are building a brand online. And Daphne and her family at Agricola Family Farm have a really unique and honestly inspiring story. So I'll let her tell it and introduce herself. I'm the oldest of five in my family. Um, We're all farmers. We are from the Republic of Congo. So uh, we moved here as refugees about in 2010 I would say May 20 2010 and since then we've been here I went to high school here I also graduated college about two years ago in May 2018 and I studied agriculture with a concentration in agronomy so farming for me is like it's it's nothing new to be honest at first I honestly did not know what I wanted to study in college but over time I think there was so many opportunity within agriculture I asked Daphne to take us all the way back to the farm's beginnings. Oh, let's see. The farm. How did it begin? Let's see. So my dad was 15 or so when he started the farm back home in the Congo. I can't, I don't know what year that was, but (laughs) somewhere over there. And he didn't really know what he was doing. His stepfather left him, you know, a huge portion of land before he, you know, traveled back to France. And he had to find a way to, you know, provide for himself. And, you know, as a young man, you, you want to be able to just have enough um, cash in your pockets and take care of yourself. And he just fell in love with that. And over time, it just kind of grew. And he also had people from like the churches to help him with seeds. And I remember one of his actually godfather helped him get two pigs that he was able to breed over time and the uh, number increased. And back then having a pig or two, it's actually really, really expensive. It's almost like having a fortune. So he was able to do that and then add some other animals. Then he continued to grow vegetables, which he would turn and sell back to the community or the church back home in the Congo. Then when we moved, when we moved to Ivory Coast, um, because of the war that happened around ni- the 1990s, I think 1998, 1999, we didn't have any way to make money. So farming, again, was one of the only way we could really do that. And that means growing, you know, we had barely about maybe 500 foot, no, 500 square foot in terms of like space to grow vegetables. And we had about perhaps 10 chicken, 
you know, and, you know, they will come as chicks and we'll let them grow. We'll perhaps sell about half of it and then the rest will leave it for the egg. And then the other portion was for the vegetables, which we used to grow pretty much like in the traditional greens that either people who are, were also refugees in Ivory Coast and could not afford to either grow the vegetables, we were able to either sell it to them. And for those who could not afford to then buy, then we will also just give it away to them as well. And over time, we had the, the status of refugee. Uh, we were admitted to have the status of refugee in Ivory Coast with the UNHCR, which is like kind of like a subdivision of the UN. And they were able to actually buy chicken from us over time. So they helped finance it. Then we will buy about maybe 1,000 chicks or so, mainly broilers. And then we will be able to sell it back to them. So by the time they come back in order, it's about 500 chicks that we have to butcher per the day and process and they'll come and pick it up. And I think that's also one reason why we were able to come to the US because they looked at how important the job that dad was doing at the time. And you know, not to say that other people weren't as worthy as we are, because I think all humans are, to be honest, it doesn't matter what you're doing. But there was just, it for us, I feel and I believe that farming was what enabled us to be resettled here in the U.S., which happened in 2010. Next, I asked Daphne to describe what transitioning both their family and the farm to the U.S. looked like and how long it took for them to start farming again in the U.S. I will say it didn't really take long for him to get back. He tried to do the normal work that people do, but it didn't work out. He didn't like it. I don't know if it's perhaps not to be bossed around or whatsoever, but there's just something when you love it, and especially at the young age you started, it had to continue. So he got involved with an organization, an organization called Fight It Forward, and they help refugees still till today when they resettle here to kind of teach them farming so that they can get back to their life and be able to provide for the family and so my dad was involved with them he was one of the first actually farmers in that first class to graduate from the program and to also learn from Planted Forward as well and in 2013 it's actually when we really established a farm um, in the Houston area we had about less than an acre I would say less than an acre and we were able to grow everything you know, like from radishes to tomatoes to kale, pretty much seasonal things. And about three years later, we could say, well, I think it's time to move to a bigger land. And then we moved in 2016 to Cleveland, which is about um, perhaps one and a half hour away from Houston. So, and it's out in the country. It's, it's very beautiful there. You don't hear any cars. I mean, maybe now you do, but it's not as crazy as in a city. And plus there's something about just the fresh air uh, especially when you grow the vegetables, which is like super important. I think just using a land that's never been cultivated. And since then, we've been there. Daphne went on to explain where she feels like she can be really helpful on the farm. So where I come in is through college, I've tried to find ways to help my parents increase the profit, increase the production, find customers. So even when I was in school, I was still helping with the communication, being that my parents actually, they speak English, but not as perfect, I would say, or perhaps not as me, but they get, you know, they get around with the way they speak, but it's like, I'm, I'm that one person behind that just runs stuff, but I still did, I still give the credit to my dad for doing all the, the hard work, and yeah, you know, I just, I'd say, well, I'll just give it a try, and I'll just do that, so I do have a full-time job on the side, but on my free time, I am either managing the Barn Tudor website or the Facebook page or just talking to regular customers, answering the questions, and, hey, when are my vegetables coming in? And, you know, the little things in between that either my dad does not or does not have time to do that I get to help with. Next, Daphne and I touched on how being online has evolved their business how it's changed the way that she works, that their farm works, and how they're connecting with their customers. I would say, one, you know, when we first started, we, I had no clue how marketing worked, you know, and that's one, I think in 2015, when we actually had just barely, no, was it 2015, 2015, 2016, when we had barely just moved 
to the land. So I was able to learn a few things from there, how to handle it. And then moving towards the more like the online marketing with now, especially with Barn to Door. At first, I was just like using Facebook. But now there is a way that I can just use to send out a mass emails and, you know, or communicate and have give that convenience to people to order the things online without having me to do the extra work. Before it used to be, I would send an email either every Wednesday or Thursday night, sometimes Friday because I'm running around, I'm late, it's just crazy. So now with like Vangido, I'm able to just send, what's it called again? Schedule the time that the emails needs to go out and it's just sent. All I need to do is like pretty much update like the numbers, what we have available and just make sure that everyone is in their like, you know, they're getting the orders correctly. So, of course, the follow-up question to how are you guys adapting to being online is how are your customers adapting? People actually loved it more for some reason. Like, it's weird. Even those people who didn't, like, really want to do it, they're like, well, this is new. Like, how can I, how, you know, how can I order things online? But it's just like, I'm like, it's like Netflix. Or it's like ordering a pizza. You know, you just click here and there, you just show what you want, and then you put your credit card and boom, you're gone. So I liked it more because of the the farm share subscription that we do. Before it was really hard to kind of keep track of it. And now like I'm able to just have, you know, when the email the last email that comes in. So my deliveries are actually on Saturdays. So I do get email reminder from Born to Do. I think Thursday night to say, hey, this is the amount of people you're going to deliver to. So I don't even need to think, oh my God, how many people am I having? Like, it's already there for me to, you know, just check and like, just print it out and, you know, just package all my things, all my vegetables and go drop off. So definitely like the online marketing did help a lot. Just having everything in one place instead of having like to be all over the place, like, you know, around Facebook and, and the email and That answer brought me to my next question for Daphne, which was, what does brand mean to you and to Agricola Family Farms? So our branding, I think for me, it's like being true to the customers. It's sharing our story so they understand why we're doing it, where we are from. Having that one-on-one conversation with a customer, for example, when you go to the farmer's market, or, you know, just posting, hey, you know, this is what happened at the farm today. For example, there's been a few times, you know, we had some dogs running into our property and, you know, we've had times where they killed perhaps 10, 15, even 100 chicken at once, you know, and those are stuff you don't just keep for yourself. You have customers out there who are willing to help you. You know, it's just like a way to find that you don't abuse of their help, but you say, okay, this is what happened today. You know, some days farming is awesome. It's fun. It's all happy, but in some days, this is what happened, you know? So just being true to the customers, just letting, sharing your story with them, letting them understand what's going on, being able to answer the question. I think that's what just like create the brand for me. And our story is our brand. I would say our story is like a way to share the brand that we, you know, that people need to see I don't you know I think sometimes with slogan and I'm like oh my god I should have put out there but it's like the story is there <laughs> you know there's not if you complicate it too much then you don't get the results that needs to be happening Daphne went on to explain how that storytelling and not making it too complicated how that comes across on social media and how deliberate she is in really telling that story and being authentic about it I'm sure you've seen like our Instagram. It's not just me. You will see there. Sometimes you will see my dad. Sometimes you will see my mom. Sometimes it's my little sisters. So, you know, I, I don't exactly do the whole like, hey, today's an introduction for little Gina. You know, she's five years old. She's seven years old and she's holding a radish. It's for me, introducing them is like, she's, you know, she's holding that cucumber. She's, you know, with her happy face and oh my God, Jenna is doing this today. And it just, it, it just shares that idea, that love with someone else without me having to be like super strict about the way I need to like share the branding with other customers. So it's kind of just like letting them learn about us 
through like what we do through the moments that we share at the farm so it makes them feel like they're actually at the farm living that moment with us i think as so many places across the country are looking down another surge in the coronavirus pandemic, I wanted to ask Daphne about the ways that COVID impacted their business earlier this year and how they were able to adapt to maintain their normal volume of sales and be really resilient in terms of the pandemic. So with the COVID, I think a lot of people did have, how would you call that, lots of challenge, you know, when it comes to sales, especially farmers. At first, you know, it was like no one wanted to go out. So you had to find a way to get the produce to the people, to get the eggs to people, you know, because it was a it was a crazy time. It happened so fast. And for me personally, in terms of my health at the moment, I had to leave the farmer's market. So that was one thing how COVID did affect me personally. And I think also affected the farm business. Our presence, we went there at the farmer's market. And it was my dad and my brother because sometimes he has some serious health issues. So he couldn't be as there as much as needed. So we lost lots of sales. Lots of customers did ask, hey, when are you guys coming back? What are you guys doing? But, you know, it, it was very that un- uncertainty during that time. Although, and then, you know, whenever, I think when Brian Chido did approach me, I was like, I was kind of, you know, not sure what to do because, you know, you're into that stress moment and you don't know what's going to work for you. Then you find out, hmm, I think now we have to work like, you know, a pizza place, like <laughs> being able to just drive and, and drop off the things. And hence why I started doing more of the home deliveries because I thought it was better. One, for health issues, you know, you just drop off the box and and you leave, but then you don't need to have that direct conversation or meet up with someone. You know, you just use either your phone or your computer to just make sure that they're getting what they need. But having like, you know, just everything there online and, and just making it convenient for them did help us in terms of like, I was able to, you know, catch up on the sales that I had lost over two months, you know, so I was able to get the customers back and say, hey, this is what we're doing. And it also helped me myself in terms of like tracking our inventory too, because, you know, at first, like, I think every Saturday when we, I had the market, I, I did it. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know what we're going to sell today. I have no idea what's running out. But now I'm able to just like keep track of everything. But then also I know what people want more of a sell. You know, some people eat more eggs and they want like five dozen of eggs per week. So you have to be able to provide that. And also that drives the sales up because now we know what we need to sell more of. I, I think that's how it's been working for us. It hasn't been easy at first, but it did increase up once like we did the online sales. I don't know who I heard that from, but they were pretty much saying, you know, you can't let something like COVID just affect you. You have to be able to find a way to work around it. Your, you know, your story's there, your 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 mentality, your positive mentality is there. How can I still drive the brand that I've been creating over the years and to still get, you know, make profit so I can pay for my bills, I can pay for the kids' foods and everything. How can I do that? So once you really ask yourself all these questions, it makes you think, huh, I need to think outside the box. I need to think like a pizza place, you know, what would they do differently? Or, you know, are they just going to close the door, you know? So it's, I think, all these questions that I had to ask myself. So I think it was very important. My last question for Daphne, as it's been for Joe and for Angelica, is if you could go back a year ago and give yourself a piece of advice, what would it be? Definitely to be open to possibilities because you never know uh, what's ahead of you. And in terms of farming, you have to open your mind to surprises. Today, it could be fire burning all the vegetables or some dogs coming in to, you know, to, to just kill all your chickens at night. You have to be able to be open and sometimes trust that, you know, there is help. There are people out there who can help you and that you're not alone in the situation once this happens. And again, COVID is definitely one, one example. You know, if we didn't reach out to people, hey, we have this much vegetables that we need to sell. What can we do to sell them? I would definitely like think about it again. Like, hey, it's it's just it's okay to stress, but don't give up. 
you have to keep working and especially with our story we've been through so much this is like only a tiny portion of it but definitely like don't give up always look for possibilities and and different ways to to just drive the cells home or or reach the goal that you've had in mind which is like expanding the farm or you know just making more profit more sales i would say so again that was daphne because at agricola family farm they are down in cleveland texas daphne also spoke at our direct farm series conference on brand and again you can go watch all of those sessions free i forgot to mention earlier but there are actually tactical sessions offered by some other barn to door team members so if you are interested in learning if your marketing efforts are working and how to use more engaging media meaning photos videos with the tools right on your phone, there are wonderful sessions for you there virtually at directfarmconference.com. Thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you again next week.